Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to verse 18. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your, will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are very grateful that you can be able to open your word, read it in a language which is familiar to us. Thank you that you have preserved your word and that you speak to us through your word by your spirit. This day we pray that your spirit who is here with us would convict and convert, would rebuke and instruct, would edify and encourage, would minister to our minds and to our hearts. May your word have a free course in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Last Sunday we so the examples of bad prayers and even the example of bad praying. And Jesus said, when you, when you pray, don't pray this way. He said, go into your room rather. When you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in secret and your father who is in secret shall reward you openly. We also saw that Jesus said, when you pray, do not use meaningless repetitions. Do not use vain repetitions. Your father knows the things that you have need of even before you ask. And so when you go to your father, have the right attitude toward prayer. It is the Gentiles, it is the heathen, it is the hypocrites, Jesus said, who like to pray with bubblings, with repetitions, who think that they shall be heard because of their much speaking, because of their many words, who like to heap up empty praise, uh, empty words when they are presenting themselves before God. So his whole point was to correct a wrong attitude of prayer that was prevalent in his day and to talk about how God receives prayer and what God says about prayer. Jesus likely preached this sermon on the mount on several occasions going by what we see detailed by Luke. When you read Luke chapter 11, Luke says, it came to pass at a certain point in time when Jesus was praying, after he ceased praying, that his disciples came to him and said, mm, Master, teach us to pray, like John taught his disciples how to pray. They must have seen something about the way Jesus was praying. They must have seen something in the way that Jesus went about his prayer time in the way Jesus spoke his words, in the posture Jesus presented himself before the Father. And they wanted to know, how can we pray like Jesus prays? Perhaps you want to know the same today. How can I pray like Jesus prayed? How can I present myself before God in a similar way that Jesus presented himself before his Father? And so Jesus says, in this manner, therefore pray. 
Pray then in this way. Pray then like this. If you want to know how to pray, the right approach to prayer, well then here it is. I'm going to detail it for you. I'm going to tell you how it looks like. I'm going to show you not only by my life, I'm also going to tell you by my words. Pray then in this way. Not necessarily using these words only. Not necessarily following this format, but including these topics that Jesus presents in this prayer. Including the virtues that Jesus brings out. Including the truth that Jesus presents here. Some people have called this prayer the Lord's Prayer. Some people have called it the Disciples' Prayer, since it was not a prayer that was being made by the Lord. Some people have called it the model prayer. The model prayer. Jesus is modeling the right way to pray, which is the model, a model one of dependence on God, a model of worship, of how to approach God, of humility in our times of prayer. When you go through this prayer, you see a lot of humility as Jesus makes the prayer and teaches his disciples how to pray. Sometimes in modern day, you go to a prayer session, and when you hear people praying, you don't see the humility. You just see people are forcing their hand on God. People are deciding for God how he shall act regarding the situations that they are in in their lives. People are commanding God. People are declaring things. People are putting themselves in the place of God. No man ever prayed like Jesus prayed. And every man who wants to pray, as, to pray as Jesus prayed, that person ought to learn from the life and the words of Jesus. I want you to observe seven things from his prayer. Seven things. Number one, sonship. Sonship, our Father in heaven. There's a special relationship there with God. And only believers, only Christians have this intimacy to be able to call God their Father. If you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, if you've not submitted your life to the authority of Christ, there is no way you can make this prayer. You can't say God is my Father. You don't have that special relationship with him. There's no intimacy with him. The same way if you are a father. Not any child can come to you and call you dad. You're not their father. You may have adopted them, maybe, and so they may call you dad. Yes, now they are your children. But I don't expect a child to come from nowhere and just come and address me as their father. I am not. I'm the father to Amanda, Jasmine, Eliel, Emuna, and who else? And Shea. Not so many. Um, Thank you for coming to visit us, by the way. Uh, there's children's church going on. If you would like to take your children, you're welcome to do that. Our jam coordinator is seated right behind you, and she can help you. But if you'd like for them to stay within the service, we are happy to have them here as well. Only believers have this intimacy as children, as sons, to call God their father. So sonship talks about our relationship with God, our father who is in heaven. Where is heaven? Somewhere up there. When we are talking about heaven, we always think of somewhere up. Even when you are lifting up your face, there's, there's a posture of dependence. You're looking to someone higher than you. The Jews had this idea when they talked of heaven. And they talked of heavens. For example, if you read in Psalm 19, it says in verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. They say there are three heavens. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he was taken up to the third heaven. And they say, oh, the first heaven is what you can see, the skies, the sky and the clouds. You can see it with your physical eyes. Then the second heaven, you can't see it. It's somewhere between those clouds and the sky. And up there today with technology, people can see that. They can go into space. They can see what lies above the clouds and above the skies. And then there is a third heaven, and that is where God dwells, where God is. Our Father who is in heaven. Why do we, how do we know it is up there? Because Jesus ascended up to heaven, and he went to the place of his Father. We address our Father who is in heaven. We have a special relationship with him. He is our Father, we are his sons, or 
daughters. Not only sonship, look at this, sacredness, rather sanctity. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed. We can't say holy. So the word here is hallowed. Hallowed be your name. Your name is holy. Your name is held in high regard. Your name is reverenced. We stand in awe of your name. God's name is taken highly because God takes his name highly. And we saw a few Sundays ago that we are not to take God's name in vain. That was the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Why? Because God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You shall not mention it carelessly or use it mis in inappropriately, but you shall use it in the appropriate awe. Because God holds his name in high regard. And there's a way that Jesus tempers this. Well, we have this intimacy with God. God is my father. I can go before him. He, I can approach him. I'm his son. I'm his daughter. I'm his child. But then on the other side, I cannot just go carelessly. I cannot just go the way I want. I have to know that because of his name, how to approach him. So, hallowed be your name. There's a sanctity of God's name. We should not misuse it. We should not abuse it. Malachi said this in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 11. For from the rising of the sun even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Number three, salvation. Your kingdom come, Jesus says. May your kingdom be seen more and more fully. Because with the coming of Jesus, his kingdom actually came into existence. But not completely. So we have the three components of a kingdom. That a kingdom must have a king, must have subjects, and the king must rule over a place. And Christ is Lord in my heart, it's the place, he's ruling over me and he is king. The kingdom has already come, but not yet. We shall explore more of this in Matthew 13. But may your kingdom come, Jesus says. It is a declaration, it is not a request. It is an affirmation, it is not a request. It portrays longing to see God's work, God's word, God's program, God's promises fulfilled. We must have long, that longing as Christians. Day after day after day after day, Father, may your kingdom be established. We even sing like that, may your kingdom be established on our praises. So you need to pray like that, may your kingdom come. Especially as the day approaches, the day of Christ's return. Especially as wickedness increases. Especially as we long to see Christ more and to be with Christ more. May your kingdom come. Father, we want to be in your kingdom. Not only sonship and sanctity and salvation, but this prayer also contains surrender. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, surrender. Not what I want, but what God purposes. Not what I want, but what God determines. Not even as I want it, but as God wants it, as God has determined. What is the will of God? We have looked at this in a sermon in the past. In a nutshell, it is this. The will of God is revealed in the scriptures. If you have been asking, what is the will of God? What is the will of God for my life? What does God want from me? What does God require from me? I'm asking you to go and read the scriptures. God has already given his revealed will to us. It is simple. It is clear. Everything that is necessary for our salvation and our sanctification, God has revealed it in the Bible. So go and read it in the Bible. And look at the scriptures. You will find the will of God. God, Jesus says, may your will be done. May it be accomplished. May it be fulfilled. When Jesus was praying in the garden at Gethsemane, in Matthew 26 and verse 42, he prayed and said, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. May it be accomplished. And I know this is a struggle for Christians. 
I know this is a struggle for you and me because our desires compete against God's desires. It's a struggle because we do not see what God is doing. In difficult times, in distressing times, in dark times, in times of doubt and afflictions especially, we wonder where is God? There's a song that says, does Jesus care? Is he here with me? Is he concerned about me? Is he concerned to sort all these things out? We do not see what God is doing. Even through that, God is working all, out all things for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. So Jesus says, may your will be done. It's a struggle for us because we have a will of our own. There is something I want, and it's not necessarily what God wills. So our prayer has always been, God, help me to surrender, help me to submit, help me to understand what you are doing. And so there is surrender there, there is submission. Number five, supply. Supply. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. The word daily there means give us our necessary bread. Give me today's provisions, tomorrow's provisions. Bread for now, bread for later, bread for today, bread for tomorrow. Bread for the present time, bread for the future time. Give us this day our daily bread. And that word daily, this is the only place in the New Testament where it is translated as daily. And so some people have said it may mean one of three things. I don't think it is all three things, but it, some people have come up with all manner of things as to what it means. The coming life, Communion or continuing needs. And that's just my alliteration so that I can remember. But coming life, communion and continuing needs. Some people feel it means this word daily. It pictures life in the fulfilled kingdom. But if it talks about communion, it speaks of that bread that we take every time we have the Lord's Supper. Give us this day our daily bread. Again, notice the us, not an individual prayer, but a communal prayer. But I am convinced it means it refers to our continuing needs, our physical, our material, our spiritual needs, our daily necessities that sustain our life. And we do need these things that sustain our life. It means whatever is necessary for living, not in excess, but also not less. As that word means, whatever is necessary for our life, whatever we need, not even what we want. Give us this day our daily bread. Samson is known for, I mean, Solomon is known for all manner of things. Some people tend to concentrate on the small part of his life where he did some wicked things. But he also did many, many, many amazing things. But people focus on the wrong things that he did. It's just human nature to look at faults rather than achievements, to look at what is wrong rather than what is going right. Imagine if God had written his word and from Genesis to Revelation, it was an account of only perfect people. Could you imagine that? What standard would that set for you and me today? We would hold these people in high regard. We would put them on a pedestal. But God wants to demonstrate that he uses ordinary, everyday people like you and me. People who are, who are really nobodies like the disciples. They said of them, these are ordinary unschooled men, yet they have turned the world upside down so that the glory may go to him. At the end of Solomon's life, he says in Proverbs 30, verse 7 to verse 9, 
Two things I request of you. Deprive me not before I die. Remove falsehood and lies from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food allotted to me. That word allotted there means food that is convenient, that is needful, that is sufficient, that is my portion. Feed me with food that is allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Because in times when we are full and when things are going well and when people are rich and when things are working out in their lives, we feel, hmm, I'm actually good. God, I can take it from here. I'm all right. So the prayer life goes down, the devotional life goes down, the working on the marriage goes down, the taking care of the children goes down, things are going well. Solomon says, I don't want to be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Because the Bible does talk about the deceitfulness of riches as it talks about the deceitfulness of sin. Or lest I be pure, poor and still and profane the name of my God. Poverty is horrible. It causes people to do all manner of desperate things. In a desperate attempt to for example, sustain your life. Someone may go and steal and rob and kill because they want to live. Now Solomon says, I need a balance. I don't want to be that rich. I don't want to be this poor. I want what is necessary for me. Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. What a beautiful prayer to make because our propensity, our inclination is just to heap up. There is never enough. You can never have enough clothes. You can never have enough uh, smartphones, you can never have enough cars, you can never have enough shoes. Certainly some of the women would agree to that. You can never have enough of this or the other or the other. You just want to heap up things. Jesus says, let's pray like this. God, give us this day our daily bread. And if you forget it, read this prayer every day. I do that every day because I also forget it. Why did that man preach the gospel every day to his people? Do you remember? Because we forget the gospel every day. Why do we read the word of God every day? Because we read it one moment and the next moment we forget this truth. But by continual reading, the Holy Spirit reminds us what matters. And so who can be able to pray, give us this day what is necessary? Give us this day what is enough. So Jesus is talking about our needs. And from verse 19 to verse 34, which we shall see God willing two weeks from now, Jesus now addresses those needs in particular. So that's supply. Number six, set free. Set free. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Verse 12. Talking about forgiveness. Talking about release. I remember many years ago reading this verse. There, there was this guy who had helped with uh, quite a good, sizable amount of money, and, and, uh, and, and he had failed to pay me over time, and he was in a desperate situation at that time. And so he owed me. You know how it feels to be owed, do you not? They say everyone everywhere is owed some amount of money, you know, with the loans that our governments take and all those kinds of things, but he owed me some money. I've also owed people money, so I know how it feels. So after a, a, a protracted period of frustration, I was praying one day, and I happened to be reading Matthew chapter 6. And then I came on this, across this verse, verse 12. And forgive us our debts. At that instant, the Lord brought the memory of that guy. And he said, just forgive that guy your debt. And so I just canceled it out and forgot about it. Until this week when I was preparing the sermon, I, I remember that guy. Forgive us our debts. Jesus is not talking about monetary debts. Jesus is talking about spiritual debts. Notice, notice how it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Just as we forgive our debtors. Just as we have forgiven. Did you know that the forgiven forgive? People who are forgiven forgive. If you have been showed compassion, you have to show compassion. If you have been showed grace, you have to show grace. If God has shown you mercy, you have to show mercy. And God has forgiven us of a debt that we could never be able to pray to pay. Turn in your Bible just a few pages past Matthew chapter 6 to Matthew 18. 
It's not there on the slideshow so that you can turn to your Bibles. Matthew 18, 21. Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Mm, I have someone who's just offended me so much. I've just forgiven them so much. I'm tired of this. So, Jesus, so Peter gives him a number up to 70 times. I think that's quite generous. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. If you look at that, it doesn't mean that every day you count the number of times you forgive. It's not legalism. It just says forgive. And then after that, Jesus gives that parable of the unforgiving servant. There was this guy who owed a debt that they could, be able, could not be able to pay to their master. And when their master called them and said, I want my money, the guy fell down on his knees and begged for his life. And the master had mercy on the servant and said, I have forgiven you. Then this servant went out and found someone else who owed him money that he could pay maybe in a day, in a week, in a short period of time. And this same person told the servant, hey, I don't have that money, please forgive me, be patient with me. And the man could not, had none of it. Took this person, threw the person in prison. Then that master was told by his servants that that guy that you forgave, that servant you forgave, also went and found out someone who owed him and refused to forgive him and said, I will throw you in prison until you have paid the last cent. What is that master supposed to do to this servant who has refused to forgive? Verse 34 says of 18, his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers. I don't know what your version says. To the torturers. So that he should pay all that was due to him. What is the point of the parable? Verse 35 so my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. And in detail, Jesus would touch on this in verse 14 and verse 15. If you have been forgiven, you have to forgive. And I'm not naive. I know there are, there are painful situations in life. There are people who really, really hurt you. There are people who really, really hurt people. Sometimes it may be someone close to you, someone far from you, an acquaintance, a colleague, a friend, a husband, a wife, a child. They really, really hurt you. Jesus says, forgive so that your father can forgive you. And in verse 14, it is just as simple as Jesus says it. If you forgive men, they are trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you your trespasses. What does this mean? Does it mean that if I don't forgive anyone, God is going to take away my salvation? God who saved me is now going to cause me to be unsaved because I've not forgiven anyone. No. We have seen consistently in the scriptures when God saves, when Christ saves, he saves completely and permanently. Not 50%, not 75%. He will bring to an end the work that he began. It's the reality. So that is not what it means. But fellowship will be hindered as a result of disobedience. God is already giving instructions, do this, but I'm not doing it. Our fellowship surely will not be the same. So we have to forgive because God forgave us. But again you say, but, but that... That person really hurt me. They really wounded me. They really pained me. They really crushed me. Listen, Jesus crushed his own son so that you could receive forgiveness. No greater love has anyone than that. He crushed his own son for our salvation. Surely if he did that, I can also go to someone who has offended me and forgive them. Number six, safety. And lead us not into temptation, verse 13, but deliver us from the evil one. What's the meaning of this? The meaning is simple. We should, we should deeply desire 
we should deeply want to avoid sin. Just deeply want to avoid it entirely. God tests us, but Satan tempts us. God tests with the aim of strengthening our faith. Satan tempts with the aim of spoiling, with the aim of ruining, with the aim of causing us to fall and stumble. He puts snares on our way. He ensnares believers. He came to steal, lest you forget. He came to kill, and he came to destroy. There is nothing good that comes from Satan, absolutely nothing that comes good that comes from him. There's a man in the 17th century who was called Thomas Brooks. He wrote a book called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And he gave Satan's four most common tactics against believers. Number one, enticing us to sin. It's a tactic, a common tactic of Satan. Number two, keeping us from worship and spiritual disciplines keeping us from worship and spiritual disciplines. Number three, stirring up doubt. He likes to stir up doubt in God's people. Even about salvation, mm, especially to young believers, are you sure that you're born again? And number four, ensnaring people in particular circumstances. Putting snares in people's ways. And then Thomas says, that these then are then broken down into specific evil strategies. It's not a comprehensive list, but these are his most common tactics. You've likely experienced the same in your life, stirring up doubt, ensnaring you, keeping you from worship and spiritual disciplines, enticing you to sin. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, Jesus says. We need to ask God for protection, the protection that we need, spiritually speaking, so that we may not sin and fall into sin. We need to make Jesus' prayer ours every day. The devil is cunning. The devil is crafty. The devil is crazy. The devil is wicked. The devil is anything negative that you can ever think of attributing to someone, attribute that to the devil. And he is even better than you, by the way. Don't think you can outsmart him. He's been doing this for many, many centuries. But he's not greater than God. Only God can deliver you from him. And Jesus finishes the prayer by saying, yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever. Amen. The kingdom belongs to God. Everything belongs to him. All the power, all the dunamis, all the might, all the strengthening belongs to God. He's able to fight for us and to stand with us and to help us. And all the glory belongs to him forever. And then Jesus talks about fasting. When you fast, do not be like the hypocrites, he says. So when you fast, fasting is expected of Christians. It is expected that believers will fast. Fasting means denying yourself, refraining, staying away from food for some time. Why? For the purposes of prayer. Some people say, eh, you know, you can, you can, you can fast from technology, uh, you can fast from certain people who are, you know, making you be in toxic relationships and all those words they use today. You can fast from this place and you can fast from the other place. Maybe you can stay away from all those things and it would be good if you can stay away from toxic relationships and overuse of technology and all these things. But the fasting that is talked about in the Bible is actually staying away from food so that you can Dedicate more time to prayer so that you can devote and spend more time in prayer. Jesus says when you fast, don't put, don't put on a gloomy face. Don't do that. He says, do not neglect your appearance. 
The same way you prepare yourself before leaving the house. You don't just wake up in the clothes that you slept with and you walk out of the house and you go to office or church or wherever. Do not neglect your appearance. Do not do that so that you'll be noticed by people, so that your fasting may be seen by others. Don't do that. You are fasting to God, not because of people. You're fasting to God. The same way we saw you're praying to God. Question, why do people fast? Why do Christians fast? Why do believers fast? Ever ask yourself, why am I fasting? For what reason am I fasting? I want to give you 10. First, to get God's direction. That's why we fast. Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, telling us about the church in Antioch, as they were ministering and praying and fasting, God said, separate for me Barnabas and Paul for the work which I've called them. We fast to get God's direction, brothers and sisters. You're struggling with getting some certain kind of direction, pray and fast. Intensify your prayers with fasting. Number two, why do people fast? When they are going through mourning, a period of mourning. When Saul and Jonathan died in 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 12, David called everyone and said, we must mourn, we must weep, we must fast because of the death of Saul and Jonathan. Number three, we fast to give intensity to prayer. To give intensity to prayer. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 21. The disciples are not able to cast out a demon in an epileptic boy. And when Jesus comes, they ask him, your, your disciples are not able to cast this one out. And Jesus tells them in verse 21, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. To give intensity to prayer. Number four, to grow spiritual life. It's another reason why we fast. Remember Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and verse 30. Cornelius says, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. I prayed in my house. We fast to grow our spiritual life. Number five, we fast out of humility. Out of humility. Psalm 35 and verse 13. When David was feeling people that he knew were, were afflicting him, he says that he humbled himself with fasting. We fast out of humility. Number six, we fast as a result of our regular Christian life. As a result of our regular Christian life. First Corinthians chapter seven and verse five. That you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. That you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. We fast out of our regular Christian life. Number eight, we fast for protection. Ezra chapter 8, verse 21 and verse 23. When Ezra is leading people back into their home country and they reach by the river Ahava and they know there is danger up ahead. And now he can't go back to the king. He's ashamed because he already told the king, God will bless anyone who does good. But anyone who does evil, God will not bless them and will deal with them justly. So he can't go back to the king and ask for soldiers. So he asked the people, let us pray and fast that God may give us straight passage, that God may make the way right for us, that God may make way for us to go through. We fast for that reason, for God's protection. Number nine, we fast out of realization of our sinful condition. We fast sometimes because there is even one particular sin that is like a, a thorn in the flesh of our body. It's just not going away, it's just not going away, it's just not going away. I realize that I'm a sinner, so I fast and I tell God, please, Help me overcome sin. Help me in this good fight against sin. First Samuel chapter 7 and verse 6. They fasted and said, we have sinned against the Lord. These are the Israelites. The, the, the ark of the covenant had been taken by the Philistines. They'd been so wicked and God had delivered them so much into judgment that the ark of the covenant itself was taken away. And when Samuel is judging the people in chapter 7, those people fasted and they prayed. Notice how in all these places, fasting goes alongside what? Praying. 
It's not either or, it is both and. Number 10, we fast in view of God's judgment. In view of God's judgment. Jonah chapter 3 and verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. Eight words. Eight words alone were enough to convince the people of Nineveh that they were sinners. In Jonah chapter 3 and verse 4. Only eight days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Only eight days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Just that, in verse 5, the people turned from their wickedness and turned to God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth. From the greatest of them even to the least of them. Now, all of these examples you can find about fasting, all of these reasons for fasting are to God and not to people. So Jesus says, if you fast to be seen by others, you already receive your reward. Right there and then, which is really no reward. He says in verse 17, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. What does this mean? It is symbolic for rejoicing. Just put on a smile. In your, in your, in your belly, in your stomach, you may be feeling hungry. Your body may be feeling weak. But rejoice so that your fasting will not be noticed by people but only to your father who is in the secret place. Let me finish by saying this. Whenever you are fasting, you are abstaining for food for the purposes of prayer, right? And you go about your day, and at some point you feel, oh, I'm so hungry. Let me go and get a cup of tea or a whatever it is. And the thought that should come in your mind there is not, let me go and get something to eat or drink. The thought that should come to mind is, why am I hungry? Ah, it's because I'm praying. And that time then you turn to God in prayer. That hunger should remind you that there is something you're praying intensively for. It's the purpose of the hunger. Fasting should not be a hunger strike. Just you're looking at the clock. What am I finishing? Uh, uh, Victoria, what are you cooking for supper? You, you, you're just thinking, when will I eat? Then that is a hunger strike. But if you remember, why am I fasting? Why am I fasting, by the way? It is so that I could pray for, for such and such a person, for such and such and prayer item. And that person doesn't even know. Oh, yes, you come here and you're praying for the person seated next to you. They don't know. Hey, you're praying for this one life church and fasting. We, I don't know. I, no, nobody has to know, only God. You're praying for the pastor even. The pastor doesn't have to know. For your wife at home, she doesn't have to know. Your husband, your child, they don't have to know. Only God has to know. Now, that is right fasting. And this is what Jesus has been talking about from verse 1 of chapter 6. Right giving, right prayer, and right fasting that pleases the Lord. Okay, one final verse. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. For the person who is asking, what does God require of me in all of these things that you have said? Micah summarizes it. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does God require from you, by the way, and from me? But to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. If you have been asking, what does God require from me in all of these things that we have been looking at in the Sermon on the Mount? God requires three things. That you just do what is righteous and you love mercy. And that you walk humbly with your God.